Hello, and welcome to Indie Talks, a television show produced by the Hudson Independent, the leading newspaper for the river towns of Sleepy Hollow, Tarrytown, Irvington, and other communities as well. Our guest today is Paul Gallet. Paul is the president of Riverkeeper, which, by its definition, uh, tries to protect the Hudson River, but with that, the in environment that feeds in, uh, into the Hudson River itself. So it's a huge job that is very complex in terms of what's involved in protecting the river and the environment around it. There are a lot of talk topics we could talk about today, Paul, but the one I wanted to start with is the, uh, the uh, work that's being done to come up with ways to protect against storm surge after Hurricane Sandy came in and not only did incredible damage along the shorefront around New York City, but all the way up the Hudson Valley, uh, the waters rose to, to, play to points where it was destroying an awful lot of property. Now we have a proposal or a series of proposals by the Army Corps of Engineers. I think there is a menu of six options that they have offered at first, four of which I think involve creating some sort of a gateway or protective barrier for New York Harbor. Um, which on paper looks like it might be uh, functional, but tell me what does Riverkeeper think about it? Is it going to work? And if it's not going to work, why not? Barrett, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. It's really a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to the conversation because there's so much that Riverkeeper has gotten up to in 52 years acting as New York's clean water advocate. Uh, we are working to protect the river but also river communities. Mm -hmm. And also we're working to protect the drinking water supplies for nine million New Yorkers. So lots to talk about. And I'm very glad that you started off with the Army Corps process. And there's a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try to give out information in, in, in manageable bites. The Army Corps process began in June. And uh, as recently as last week, when the Army Corps and Riverkeeper were on the same witness panel at a New York City Council hearing about this issue, you could see the Army Corps working to make the process uh, a better one. Mm -hmm. uh, now, first of all, you mentioned storm surge, and I was in my office in Ossining at Riverkeeper bailing madly when our pump mm -hmm. failed and we had to keep the water out of the office and there was nine or 10 feet and then 14 feet down at New York City. And so this is a real issue, and uh, it's the sixth anniversary of Sandy today. So we are very much focused on this issue. But there's a second issue that we have to understand goes along with the problem of storm surge, and that is the problem of sea level rise. All right. Now, we've already had uh, seven, eight inches of sea level rise. And according to the best science, the widely accepted science, we're going to have as much as another 22 inches, possibly just by 2050. We let that sink in. Mm -hmm. Possibly another 22 inches by the year 2050, according to the New York City Resiliency Task Force, according to the researchers at Columbia University they're working with. So this issue of sea level rise is going to happen every day, every morning, every evening, dry weather, wet weather, lots of wind, no wind, We've got to be solving the problem of sea level rise and its impact on our shoreline communities as sure as we're solving the problem of storm surge. Right. And unfortunately, the Army Corps of Engineers project is just designed to solve the problem of storm surge. So Riverkeeper right now has several goals. Goal number one is to make sure that this is a, a process that the public is directly engaged in and that the people closest to the risk, the shoreline communities, are the ones who are driving solutions. Because if you're closer to the risk, you're more likely to be closer to figuring out how to solve a problem. The second thing we need to make sure that the Army Corps does is build storm surge and sea level rise together and solve the two problems together. Now, I'm not an engineer and I don't play one on TV, but I do know one thing. The storm surge plans, these big barriers, these in-water barriers that the Army Corps is proposing, they've got gates that remain open to let the ships come through. Mm -hmm. And when you have gates that remain open to let the ships come through, the sea level rise comes through also. So these storm surge barriers do nothing for you on a dry weather day when you're going to have that 10, 20, 22 inches more of sea level rise 
and then you're going to have high tide, or you're going to have storms that aren't uh, needing the barriers. I mean, I was on the train all over the weekend, and you should see the water come up into the Croton parking lot, or you should see the water come up mm -hmm. into the parks adjacent to the river. So we've got to really be focusing on both problems, storm surge right. and sea level rise. But how do you address those in ways that will they'll work together? I mean, it seems to me that climate change is an issue that the, the solutions are much, much larger than anything Riverkeeper or the Army Corps of Engineers all by themselves can handle, or am I wrong? No, you're, you're absolutely right. All by ourselves, we can't do anything. Right. Nobody can do anything at this point, given the seriousness of these issues, all by themselves. Right. But we've got to do things together. Now, the question of, is the water going to come? That 22 inches that I mentioned, that's going to come even if we find replacement energy, and even if we reduce our carbon loading. This is baked in. So we got to deal with this whether we like it or not. Riverkeeper is not really about reducing carbon load. There's some things we try to do. There's some things that we can continue to try to do. But we're about trying to protect the river from the problems with climate that are already baked in. Right. We got to work with the Army Corps. Most importantly, we got to work with shoreline communities. Now, just take uh, New York City. There's 520 miles of coastline in New York City alone. There's no one solution that's going to solve the problems of storm surge and sea level rise in New York City. In some places, you can put levees up on the shoreline. In other places, you're going to have opportunities where the water can go in and, and reside in low-lying wetlands areas. Mm -hmm. uh, in still other areas, you may have to reinvent how you have your buildings relate to these uh, wet areas. And you have to make sure that the buildings can withstand uh, the uh, inundation that's going to come. Long story short, every area that we have got to protect, and we're not going to be able to protect all the areas, there have been some buyouts already, we've got to develop a solution that is tied together with what you find in the community. I grew up in Thornwood, it's nowhere near the Hudson. Mm -hmm. I work in Ossining, I live in Cold Spring, different com three different communities, right. three different issues associated with those communities. You can say the same thing about Hastings, Yonkers. You can say the same thing about Riverdale, where my mother lives. And so we've got to be working with local communities. None of us is going to do this individually. Mm -hmm. But if the Army Corps is only trying to deal with these, this one big storm every, well, it's been six years since Sandy. Let's, right. say, let's say we're due for another one in a couple of years. If we, all we do is deal with these storm surge issues, we're not going to be solving the bigger looming problem of 24-7, 365, sea level rise, right. dry day or wet day. Right. Setting aside for the moment, if you can, uh, the climate change uh, effect, just looking at the storm surge barriers themselves, are there environmental, is there environmental damage that would result from creating these barriers or are they relatively benign? You mean uh, putting these barriers yeah. up and cutting off yeah, 30 to 80 percent of the tidal flow into the Hudson yeah. River? What's the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is, number one, you reduce the amount of in exchange of water. Mm -hmm. And when you reduce the exchange of water, you re reduce the oxygen that's available to the life in the river. Number two, if you put up these barriers, you reduce the amount of pollution you can get out of the river into the open water when you have these large flooding events. You trap yeah. the pollution behind the, the barriers. Number three, you put these barriers up, the communities at the edge of the barrier, they're going to get all that reflected wave energy into their community, and so they're going to get a storm that feels two, three, four times as big. Mm -hmm. Other than that, we love this idea. <laughs> and I say that facetiously because this is the wrong idea. Even the Army Corps is saying, they told one of the community boards in New York City, uh, we don't think this is necessarily doable from the standpoint of economics. $140 billion. I mean, where are we spending $140 billion for any civil works project? They're saying also that they don't think that it could conceivably be engineering feasible. They said, we may not know if this works until after it's been built and the first storm hits. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just not something you say about something that costs $140, let alone $140 billion. Mm -hmm. And they also understand the environmental impacts would be heinous. Right. Now, we need to find balance between the environmental impacts 
that we need to avoid and the human impacts that we need to avoid. And we need to do it smart and we need to do it together. And we cannot do it with this idea of these big in water barriers. It's just not feasible, just not smart. Is there anything among the six um, options that the Corps is recommending that you like? Well, the Corps is looking at onshore options. Uh, there's a proposal in Lower Manhattan to build a series of dikes and levees, mm -hmm. elevate parkland, uh, use natural features to help you solve the problem of storm surge, and they could also solve the problem of sea level rise. The beauty of the on-land options is that not only does it deal with the storm surge, it also deals with the sea level rise. Mm -hmm. So our answer is the option that solves the problems landside and that adapts how we use our, our waterside lands right. uh, to make sure that they are responsive to the problems that we have uh, coming our way from storm surge and sea level rise. The Dutch are always cited as mm -hmm. the geniuses right. here, and they've been living below Look sea level. In the dike. <laughs> they've been living below sea level for, for decades and decades. Yep. And one of the cities that supposedly has the best solutions is the city of Rotterdam. Rotterdam is working on what they call and this is very highfalutin, but it's a pretty good phrase, and I'm going to use it anyway. An architecture of accommodation. And when I say an architecture of accommodation, I mean figuring out how you can keep the water out, where you can keep the water out, and figuring out how to make sure that the water that you're not going to be able to keep out doesn't do damage. Mm -hmm. And they're reinventing their land use through this sort of approach. Is it working? I think, they're, it having, I think they're having excellent results so mm -hmm. far. And I know one other thing. They built some barriers back in the day, and their scientists are telling us that they wish they could have that back because they've destroyed the fish populations mm -hmm. in the waterways inside those barriers, and there is no need to do that. If you want to protect human communities, you can do it without destroying the river ecology. And let's remember, when uh, you know, I, I graduated from high school in Westchester in 1977, and uh, that was, you know, I guess that was more than 40 years ago. And 40 years ago, nobody was talking about this. Right. And also, nobody was looking at the Hudson, because the Hudson was a mess. Now the Hudson is a huge draw. People used to turn away from the Hudson, and now they turn to it. Mm -hmm. Now they're swimming in the Hudson. Now they're doing uh, you know, kayaking, and they're doing triathlon events. And this has become a huge quality of life draw in Westchester, in Rockland, in New York City. And so we really don't want to destroy the Hudson in a misbegotten effort to protect ourselves right. from climate-related storms and sea level rise. Right. So there has been improvement in the quality of the water in the Hudson River over the long haul. Um, is it enough? How far do we have to, how far have we come? How far do we have to go? Well, let me give you two answers to that question, one for the people and one for the fish. Because we really are about both. And if we're not about both, right. uh, we're, we're not getting it done. Water quality has improved from the standpoint of reduction of bacteria in the water, which is good if you're going to be in the water or in a boat or in a mm -hmm. kayak, bacteria not being something you want to let get in your system. And there's a million waterborne illnesses that people pick up in this country a year because of contact with bacteria in swimming and boating. So we've reduced bacteria levels. We have a lot more way to go on that, and I'll get to that in a minute. We've also increased the dissolved oxygen levels in the waterways which the fish need to survive and thrive. And so that's good for the fish too. But where we need to go from here for both is that, let's start with the fish. The fish have uh, the areas where they used to spawn uh, and they used to have as their feeding habitat. They've been cut off by dams on the 60 or so different tributaries we have on the Hudson right. below Troy. And we've got to open up some of those tributaries to the fish again because they've lost their historic spawning grounds. And the amount of fish that we have in the Hudson and the tributaries now is a tiny remnant of what we used to have. You know, we're talking about 1%, 5%, 10%. There was a, a famous uh, book written by a great marine biologist named uh, John Waldman. It's called Running Silver. And it was taken from how people used to describe the Hudson when they first saw it, mm. back right after the Westerners came right. uh, from Europe to, to the Hudson. Back when the Tap and Z was named a Z. <laughs> back when it was just a Z. And they said that on a day when the fish were running and the sun was out, it looked like the river was silver. It 
was running silver with the backs of the fish that were madly running back to their ancestral spawning grounds. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So we got to get those dams out of the way. They're not used anymore to generate power. We have a grid. The grid is quite adequate. Maybe we can get to that yeah, when we right. talk about Indian Point. And long story short, we can also continue to reduce the pollution that draws down the dissolved oxygen so that the fish can breathe even in the hottest, uh, mm -hmm. ugliest, steamiest day of the summer. Now coming back to the people and the water quality, we're actually working on the drinking water that's taken from the Hudson. Because if you're up in Dutchess, you take your drinking water from the Hudson. And sure it gets filtered and sure it gets protected, but wouldn't you like to make sure yeah. that we're removing as much pollution from that river as possible? Even if you don't take your drinking water from the Hudson, even if you're in Westchester, where I grew up, where we get from the Catskills, you get the drinking water from the Catskills. But you still want the Hudson to be clean, because you still want the Hudson to be safe for yourself and your friends to go swimming mm -hmm. or boating, and you want it to be beautiful too. And that's why Riverkeeper does a shoreline cleanup every May. We have 110 different sites along the Hudson where we bring out 2,300 volunteers. Uh, you know, first sa Saturday in May to do shoreline cleanups, and we bring like 40 tons of trash mm -hmm. off the river. Right. So a lot of work to be done, but good progress so far. Right. Speaking of trash, there's a lot of talk recently about plastic. Uh, great islands of plastic floating around out in the ocean that have aggregated themselves out there, coming down from the rivers, uh, the kills and stuff up and down the Hudson, into the Hudson itself and down into the harbor. Um, this isn't a new problem. Uh, I assume that we've had plastic and plastic bags for a long time, but now people are talking about it. How come? What's changed? Uh, ah, where to begin? This is this is the the real downer part of the show, and <laughs> I'm, I apologize to you and your audience ahead of time. You've got plastic in seafood. You've got plastic in drinking water. You've got plastic in bottled water. No sense in drinking bottled water. We have some of the best quality public off drinking the water. Of the bottles. That's possible too. Mm -hmm. And you've got plastic in people's bodies. And they're measuring it in every different possible way. It's, it's become a scourge. And so we've got to find alternatives to plastic packaging. You know, the Ulster County just passed a law uh, literally five or six days ago that said no more single-use plastic bags at grocery stores or restaurants. Bring your own bag, it's called a bring your own bag law. Mm -hmm. Bring your own bag, uh, pay five cents for a paper shopping bag, but long story short, it's time to take serious action. You don't want plastic in the food you eat. You don't want plastic to become a part of you. You don't want plastic to uh, have all the toxic chemicals that come out of your water treatment plants adhere onto these particles of plastic, and then you're getting it worse than just plastic uh, when you come into contact with it or when it's in your drinking water. You're getting toxics too. Right. So there's a lot of reasons why we have to cut back on the plastics, but you know, you just have to look at some of these pictures of the sea turtle wrapped in a plastic uh, bag that's, that's cutting off its breathing or cutting mm -hmm. off its ability to eat. Or look at these large areas in the Pacific or in the South Atlantic that are polluted by plastic, you know, for miles, square mile after square mile. But when you know that this stuff is in the food you eat or the water you drink, mm -hmm. you know, I think people get it. Yeah, I think they do. Um, plastic is petroleum-based. Um, we don't want people to burn petroleum any more than they have, and hopefully a lot less uh, going forward for ecological, for environmental and ecological, and just saving um, fossil fuel use. But is there any legitimate, relatively benign use for plastics, to, for petroleum products out there that is not going to create the kinds of problems that you just described? Well, let's say you have medical equipment and you can't make it without plastic. I mean, there are limits to every effort to be more sustainable. Right. And you don't want to undo some of the things that are essential that you can't do without plastic. But single-use plastic bags, yeah. styrofoam clamshells, take-home no containers, right. those are no brainers. Let's start to make the change that we know we can make without a lifestyle change, and then you get more used to being more sustainable, and you build that sustainability 
It's time to get going on the good foot. So we're not here to say stop using all plastics. We're saying stop using unnecessary plastics because wouldn't you rather have seafood and drinking water that doesn't have plastic right. in it? Have you had conversations with the, the plastic manufacturers, people like DuPont, about what they're doing, can do, uh, to reduce the harmful effects of their products? Well, the plastic manufacturers are dedicated to stopping this effort to reduce the amount of plastic that's being used because they just want uh, gross sales and net profits. And they're fighting these plastic bag mm -hmm. bans. They're threatening lawsuits with municipalities that are thinking of doing similar restrictions. Municipalities want to do the good thing. I knew it when I ran the Westchester Land Trust. I know it now that I'm running Riverkeeper. And the industry is looking to protect market share. Right. And it, it gives me no pleasure to say that. And they're not doing anything in terms of research to find out ways to well, they're actually pushing a, a false alternative, which they say, well, we can recycle styrofoam packaging. We can cycle, recycle single-use plastic bags, despite the fact that the actual experience shows that you cannot effectively recycle these materials. And uh, the uh, styrofoam manufacturers challenged New York City's ban on the styrofoam containers and went all the way up to the highest court in the state. And the highest court in the state said, you know, we've seen the science, we've seen the reports, we've seen the studies. You can't recycle this stuff. The city's ban is righteous approved. Hmm. And of course, that's not their responsibility to recycle anything. They're just going to manufacture it. <laughs> they will tell you that they are sustainable, but they want to be sustainable by selling as many single-use plastic bags and styrofoam containers as they can, and it's the wrong way. Right. Let me switch gears, because uh, we don't have that much time. I would like to talk about Indian Point. I know it's something the Riverkeeper was very much involved in negotiating the closure with energy of the plant. Um, and most people look forward to 2021-22 when both of the uh, uh, facilities there are going to be shut down. But it's a much more complicated process than that, with a lot of danger that's involved in the shutting down of a plant like that. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you negotiated in that contract to try to keep the bad things from happening as the plant shuts down? Um, and uh, then we can get to the actual energy use. The okay. issue is how you replace it. So the, f the first issue is spent fuel management. The second is decommissioning the reactors that, of the radioactive material. Mm -hmm. The third is groundwater contamination. So uh, since I, I never know when the clock is going to be up, I'll go very quickly and you can <laughs> expand me on any one if you want. Uh, the issue of spent fuel management was written into the closure agreement that a certain amount of spent fuel has to be moved out of the storage pools into dry storage uh, every year because dry storage is safer, more secure, and will uh, manage itself without the need for continued maintenance of those spent fuel pools right. uh, on the long haul. Uh, and that process has begun already? It That's has begun. So the spent fuel management is on its way. The sad part is that we were supposed to have had a long-term repository to move the spent fuel to, concentrate it around in one uh, area around the country, and bring it away from all the hundred reactors around the country. And that just is not happening. You're going to be dealing with this spent nuclear waste on site for decades, if not longer, right. because they were going to move it to under a mountain in Nevada, and that isn't happening mm -hmm. because of politics. So the municipalities who are affected by the need to continue to store this waste, Buchanan and Cortland especially, they need the power to collect host fees mm -hmm. from Entergy for the fact that this land is being made unusable, possibly in perpetuity. And to be hosting this terribly radioactive material for centuries, for millennia, for tens of millennia, these communities need to be compensated. And they're not being compensated according to the contract as not. it exists now. They are not, because that is not something that Entergy was willing to do, and there needs to be legislation. Mm -hmm. So let's move to decommissioning. Believe it or not, the uh, Laws at the federal level allow the decommissioning not just to go 60 years, but to start after 60 years. Wow. And they have a phrase called safe store, where you put the reactors into safe store mode while you're getting ready to decommission. Well, we think that the decommissioning can start sooner. 
can be done within 10 to 20 years, can be done safely in that time, at which point there would be land that was able to go into productive use in these communities. And we understand the impacts on the communities, and we want to see this land productively used just as long as it's not storing nuclear waste. Right. And then the groundwater needs to be uh, cleaned because there is a significant amount of radiological materials that's been dumped into the groundwater over the years. Mm -hmm. The other side of the equation is the impact economically on those communities around there. An awful lot of jobs are going to be lost when energy shuts down. Um, how, is Riverkeeper involved in that side of the equation at all in terms of economic development in the area, or is that something that you leave to the state and, and the local communities to deal with? Well, we do what we can. We're not uh, economists and we're not job creators, but we certainly are urging uh, the state to provide uh, interim funding. We feel that the um, spent fuel tax that we're talking about could help the communities. We also understand that you can have uh, a tremendous number of jobs in renewable energy. You can have, I mean, if you're an electrician, you're not going to lack for work. If you're an engineer, you're not going to lack for work. But you can repurpose the, the staff and Entergy has promised jobs, uh, I believe, to everybody who's currently on the staff and other locations. But you can keep those people in the community if you really max out on energy efficiency and renewable energy. Right. That's a good transition because we're running out of time, and I do want to talk about how we replace the energy production that's going to be lost when Indian Point shut, shuts down. I know there's going to be electricity coming down from Canada. Uh, that's going to take up a large chunk of that, but walk us through the rest of that equation and how you replace it. So without any energy from Canada being brought down, because that line hasn't been built, we right. don't know whether it's going to be built, without any of these new natural gas plants that people are touting, with only the available capacity, mm -hmm. the grid operator, known by the acronym NISO, Right. has said we have, uh, of the 2,000 megawatts of Indian Point Power, we already have 1,900 of those replaced, 1,900. Then, 95%. Or 95%. That. that was the end of 2017, December 2017. Then in April they say, oh, guess what? Energy efficiency efforts are so effective that we think that the peak demand in the lower New York area has come down by 380 megawatts. Wow. So 1,900 to 2,000 is only 100 more megawatts. Now they have another 380 that's going to be available before the plant closes. And by the time a decade goes by, they're going to have 700 more megawatts in savings. Energy efficiency is the way to go. Even easier, even better, even more jobs mm -hmm. than the renewables. Right. And they say that the people don't like the, you know, wind power because wind power, the wind doesn't always blow or the sun doesn't always shine. You always get the energy efficiency benefits. Right. So the grid operator says we've got enough power already without new natural gas, without new hydro from Canada. And the more we do to increase energy efficiency and renewables, the more we can draw down the fossil-based fuels we use. We don't need a single additional cubic foot of natural gas to close Indian Point. Right. And those improvements are happening regardless of what happens with Indian Point. They're, they're ongoing efficiencies. They're Not only are they ongoing, the governor has proposed to ramp them up from 1% a year savings in energy efficiency improvements to 3%. Yeah. Well, that's a piece of good news that we can end on. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Great. Paul Gallet, thank you very much for your time, and uh, good luck with all your efforts. Oh, Barrett, thanks so much. I'm glad to be on today.